Thanks, man. Please be seated. Good morning. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Was that me? Was that me on the mic? Is everybody in Matthew 6? I just was giving you a moment to uh, get there, you know? Different, uh, different preacher strategies to get, you know, get you have time to turn there, you know? Get ready for that walk. Get ready for that 5K, stretching out. This morning we're going to talk about worshiping God's way. Worshiping God's way. We've been in the scriptures and um, looking at the Sermon on the Mount before. We do that, I'd like to pray, all right? Oh, God, I just want to thank you for, you know, you must feel privileged to have me as your child. I mean, you know how long we've been together, Lord, and I just want to thank you for uh, letting me be your child because, whew, you must be pretty proud of me. I remember that one time I fasted. I mean, I don't like to brag, but oh, I was so hungry. You remember that time? I was, oh, gosh, I told Debbie about it. <sighs> Sorry, Lord. Uh, and I just was so hungry, but Lord, I'm just, the, every pain that, that hit my stomach, I remember, I remember. Joyce, you remember that too? I was, every pain, every pain, Lord, every pain was for you. It was for you, and I know that it was a, don't eat any food fast except bake that one bagel sandwich from uh, Dunkin' Donuts. But Lord, I know you show grace to someone like me because after all, I was fasting for you. Oh, man. What a, what a privilege. What a privilege to be here today to hear me preach, Lord. I just want to say, I just want to say, and I know that the people that haven't read ahead in Matthew 6 right now are probably like, what is this guy doing? But the rest of us know that I am modeling what not to do when you pray. But Lord, thank you for your grace. I could go for that bagel sandwich right now. Maybe I should walk back outside and get another bagel sandwich. Oh, thank you, Lord, for being my father, because I know you're blessed to have me as your son. Amen. Where's the lightning? Yeah, thank you. Okay, even if you haven't read ahead, what do you think about that sort of prayer style? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Boo! Boo! Now, I'm super hyper exaggerating, but Jesus is going to talk to us this morning about not being those people. Not being those people. People that have even their worship of God not focused on God, but instead focused on themselves, right? Not focused on themselves. I don't know about you, but it, it sort of goes without saying that our worship of God should be focused on God and about God rather than ourselves, but sometimes that's not the case with me. Have you ever heard the expression, I think, I don't know if Pam invented this or snatched it from somebody, but uh, seeking God for his face and not his hand, right? Seeking God for God, not just what he has to give to us. And he certainly does give us things, but seeking him for him, seeking him for him. And that's Jesus' heart. Jesus did everything that he did to glorify his Father, which is in heaven. Everything. His whole life. The way he dealt with the, the, the dredges of society, the way he dealt with the best of society. He did it to glorify God. And that's what we want to do as well as his disciples. Amen? As his disciples. Uh, this morning we are going to talk about worshiping God's way. And last week, you remember from the end of chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, we talked about righteousness not just being uh, outward righteousness. You remember that? The Pharisees, they were very righteous on the outside, but in their hearts, they would pray prayers like the one I just prayed, perhaps. Right? Righteousness and doing the right thing is not 
just about what you're doing on the outside. God is concerned about what's going on in the inside. Amen. He's concerned about what's going on in the heart. And what Jesus, uh, what the, the challenge that we have from Jesus is whether we determine what we do in our lives based on what Jesus says or based on what our society and our religious tradition says. He said over and over again in chapter, chapter 5, you've heard that it was said that you should do this, but then what did he say after that? But I say unto you, right? There's a conflict that exists between the way people have always lived their lives and what happens when you follow Jesus. And thank God Jesus shows us the way in which we can walk that will lead to a life that glorifies God. And I want to make one point about what we looked at last week that I really hope resonates in your soul this morning. God, what did we talk about last week? We talked about vows. We talked about divorce and remarriage. We talked about adultery. We talked about lust. We talked about loving your enemies. We talked about anger. We talked about a lot of different things. God will not allow us to be in a situation. Please hear this. God will not allow us to be in a situation where we are not left with an option to obey Jesus Christ. God will not allow us to be in a situation that will, will not allow us the option to obey Jesus Christ. Now that sounds like a nice thing to say. But the, that reality is true when you are in the trial of the anger and hatred. When you are in the trial of loving your enemies. When you are in the trial of divorce and remarriage. When you are in the trial of adultery and lust. Those things are difficult. Those things are hard. But God, God will not allow us to be in a situation where our only option is to disobey Him. Sometimes we feel that way though. Right? Sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we feel like the only option we have is that we can just do it our way, take matters into our own hands, right? Justified anger, justified lust, justified hatred, justified divorce, justified all these different things. But God is so good that he doesn't allow us to be in a situation where our only option is something that's going to disobey his son. That gives me such great hope. He doesn't put us in, they're difficult. I put myself in these situations more often than not, where I think the only option is to just do it my way. But God does not let that be the case in our lives. I wanted to say that before we moved on this morning, because I really wanted to say that, and I, and I forgot to mention it last week, that in all these, all these issues, the, the dark and heavy and chaotic and crazy times in our lives, we are not ever left without the option to follow Jesus Christ, even if the result of that may lead to something drastic in our lives. He's, he doesn't let us go down that path. I wanted to say that before we moved on. This morning when we look at Matthew chapter 6, one of the things that we really have to uh, talk about this morning is motive. Motive. The definition for motive is something that causes a person to act, right? The reason why everyone just ran out of the building was because there was a fire. What was your motivation to run out of the building? Well, there was a fire. The reason why we were caused to act was our motivation, because of the fire, right? When uh, Valerie Shuley's cookies start baking in Cranston, all of the neighbors start flocking to her house because their motive is, their motive is these chocolate chip cookies, which are uh, unrivaled. Right, motive, something that causes a person to act. So when we talk about worshiping God and giving to the poor and prayer and all these different things, what is our motivation in doing these things? Is it for God or is it even in a religious surface for ourselves? We're going to have to ask that this morning. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? Why don't you ask your neighbor that this morning? Put the burden on them. Why do you do what you do? And ask them back. Ask them back. Don't let them off the hook. Someone needs to ask Tom. Tom, why do you do what you do? Victor, why do you do what you do? What's your motivation in, in worshiping God? What's your motivation? What's your motivation? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no what? No reward with your Father who is in heaven. Beware of practicing your righteousness. Righteousness means, you know, the good things that you do, right things. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them 
Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. That really sums up the rest of the verses we're going to look at this morning. The good that we do should be motivated by God. It should be motivated by the things of God and, and our love for God and our love for other people. It should not be motivated by ourselves. Because do we receive a reward when we do good things for other people? Sometimes we do, don't we? Don't we receive accolades, compliment, attention, right? Uh, praise, thanks. And those things feel good. I like receiving those things, don't you? Right? But is that our motivation for why we do what we do? Or is it because we're doing it to glorify God? Jesus says, watch out about practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward for your Father who is in heaven. If our uh, desire is to be rewarded in the temporal by the accolades that come from doing the good thing, what we, what we trade is we, re we trade receiving a reward from our Father in its place. So it's all about weighing here what it is you want. My, there's a, there's a lighthearted joke in my, uh, my house where we talk about, you know, when, so, when mostly me, I get full of myself and talk about how wonderful I am. You know what I did the other day? Bless, I'm glad my wife's not here <laughs> right now to hear this. But I said to her, thank you, honey, for taking out the garbage. And she said, I didn't take out the garbage. I said, oh, that must have been me. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> I took out the recycling too. <laughs> and so what, what's common in, that, in those instances is we say, well, I hope you enjoyed your reward, right? Because I just got it. I just got whatever, pra whether it's something small like that or something greater, you know, some work for the Lord. I just earned, that's it, it's over. I'm trying to milk it by telling all of you that I took the garbage out. You know what I mean? But that's it. It's gone, right? It's gone. So it's a trade. Okay, the good that we do, the righteous things that we do, do we do it to receive a temporal, uh, this world sort of reward, or do we do it? Even though we may receive those, but we do it to bless God now, to glorify God, and to have him reward us for those good things in the kingdom that's coming. That's the question. Look at uh, verse 2. First thing he talks about is uh, giving to the poor. When you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by who? By men. Truly I say to you that they have their reward in full. When they're honored by men by the giving to the poor, that's what they get. That's all they get. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus uses this great picture it's going to be so, so secretive that if your right hand is, if your left hand is giving the money to the poor, your right hand doesn't even know that it's happening. That's the kind of heart that our, our giving to the poor should be done in. When you give to the poor, don't, you let, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will do what? Will reward you. So how did the Pharisees, how did the hypocrites, how did the people that were concerned about their outward righteousness do their giving to the poor? Dun, 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 dun. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an announcement to make this morning. Victor, the righteous, is about to tell you something spectacular. I just wanted to let everyone know that I gave $3 to a uh, homeless man that needed $5 yesterday. And uh, I just wanted to tell you all of that. I don't know how I figured out the rest, but I gave him the first three. Thank you very much. Dun, 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 dun. This message was brought to you, right? That's what they would do. I'm dead serious. They would announce, right? One of the things that they would do often is that they would name things after themselves so that you knew that this building was the Victor Gluckin Memorial Homeless Person Help Center. Because I wanted you, was it doing great work? Yes. But for me, I was doing it so that I would be noticed and remembered for the great things that I had done. And not just do it simply for God. If no one ever knew, Jesus says, beware about that. Be on your guard. What's your motivation for the things that you do when you give to the poor? Right? 
Give it in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. This word hypocrite is a great word that maybe uh, has lost its original meaning. When you think about a hypocrite today, you think about somebody that says one thing but does another, right? Right, that says they're righteous, but really they're not, and, and things like that. Uh, the, the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word that was used for the actors, uh, the, 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 the dramatic actors back in this, in this time of theater. And the hypocrites would often use masks. This is how they would do it. They would use masks to portray themselves as one character. They would take the mask off and be their, themselves, or they'd put another mask on to determine that they were now a, a woman, or now they were the villain, or now they were the happy or the sad. You know the, the image that you most often see for theater, right, are the two masks, right? That's where this comes from. So what a hypocrite is, is someone that is putting on a mask to portray one thing, but when in reality, it's something else underneath. Isn't that an interesting way to look at this, right? That's what this is talking about when the hypocrites do it to be noticed by men. So my desire is to be genuine when I do things that I would give to somebody in need because God's given to me and because that person has a genuine need, not to be noticed by other people, right? What's your motivation? Is it for God or is it for yourself? So here's two questions to ask in light of that. If no one would ever find out that you did a good deed, would you be okay with that? Now, of course, everyone's like, yes. Think about that for a second. If no one would ever find out that you did a good deed, would you be okay with that? If even the recipient of that good didn't know that it was from you, would you be okay with that? Interesting. Some of us would uh, be challenged with that, right? I did something good for Tim a few years ago, and like I'm always just like creeping around him, smiling big. Hey, what's going on? Oh, nothing, man. I just got to bless somebody the other day. Oh, I really shouldn't tell you. Oh, well, somebody blessed Tim's telling me. Somebody blessed me the other day. It really blessed me. It really met my need. Oh, really? That's funny because that's kind of what I did. It was me. I'm sorry. I'm just so blessed that I had to tell you it was me, brother. It was me. Tell Debbie. <laughs> it was Victor. There goes. That's my reward right there, right? If nobody ever find, found out, would we be at peace with that? Would we be okay with that? Now, should people ever know that we do the good things? Certainly, right? Here it says that the, the point of it is, is that we don't do it to be noticed by men, that we don't do it so that we are the focus. Uh, we're supposed to be a light, aren't we? It says in Proverbs 27 too, let another person praise you and not your own mouth. That's good wisdom in this, right? If Debbie finds out that I was the one that did the good thing and she tells Tim and they come and thank me and bless me, praise God. A double blessing. Know that that person was blessed and knowing that I did it for God to be blessed. Now, some of us at this, uh, with some of these verses about doing things in private are rejoicing because some of us really aren't doing anything and just like that we can go on, stay undercover. The point is that we're doing these good things, that we are praying, that we're just not praying for everybody, that we are caring for the poor, that we're just not blowing a trumpet and things like that. Right? It's not about living private, my own personal relationship with God, a.k.a. I don't really even live for God, but I just say that so you don't get on my case anymore. But it's, it's that we do it for God. That we do it for God. Much of what we will do for God will never be known by other people, I imagine. And some of it will. Some people, as I said the first week we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, will see our good works and glorify our fathers in heaven. Right? Sometimes when people uh, you know, are in need, of, in need of money off the street and they come to the church, you know, and, I, and I pray, all right, Lord, should we help them? What do you want me to do? And in these instances where we do help them, this is what I say. I say, let me tell you this. The, this is a gift from God. This 20 bucks that you need to help you get down the rest of the road in your life, this is from God. People who, who are no better than you or I come to this church and, and support this ministry so that we can glorify God, that we can pay the bills, and that we can help people. This is from God. Think of it as that. Think of this as from God. Think of this as from God. Not from me, not from even the church, but from God. That, that's what I want the focus to be, right? Look at the next thing here in the prayer, uh, verse 5. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. 
Why? So that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, disciple, follower of Christ, when you pray, go into your inner room. Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, He, 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 he wants us to pray. Amen? Right? Of course we want to pray. Of course we want to seek the Lord through prayer. But He says that the way that the hypocrites did it is that they prayed in a way that got them noticed by men as opposed to they just cared that God heard their prayer. That God heard their prayer. There have been times in my life when I've wrestled even whether to pray out loud because I'm thinking about what I'm going to pray so much that I say, Lord, is this for you or for them? Sometimes I will, you know, will be a prayer and I don't even pray because I don't want to wrestle with people uh, looking at my eloquence or something like that. This is for God. Now, I get so blessed when other people pray. Sometimes at our prayer meeting, I am, I am more strengthened by what other people pray, and I'm just, you know, piggybacking on it, saying, yes, Lord, what well, he said, amen, amen. Right? I, I love to hear people pray out loud, but I want my prayers and our prayers to be God-focused, not self-focused, amen? God-focused, not self-focused. One of the, the ways that we can <laughs> know that it's self-focused is verse 7. When you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Huh. People that don't know God, they pray just to pray. They pray meaningless repetition. And they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need when. Before you ask Him. I'm, uh, come on, that is just a ridiculous verse. That is that, I want that plastered all over my house. Your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. How about that with all the financial troubles of the last few years? Your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. All right? What about that with, with all the, the different trials of marriage, of children, of all these different things? Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So how does that change your approach in asking him? You can approach a God that you can trust, knows what you need, and can provide for you. You don't have to try to get his attention by sounding all fancy and praying for hours and hours and hours, the same thing over and over again. Why not go to him with a pure heart saying, Lord, I know you know what I need. Show me what you want me to do so that I can see your provision in my life. Don't just pray long and long and long thinking that we'll be heard just because we're praying a long time. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Our prayers should be God-focused and not self-focused. God-focused and not self-focused. Amen? And here's a good example of a God-focused prayer. We could do a whole sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. We could look at the Lord's Prayer, you know, and maybe we will, all on its own. But I want you to think about it in light of the context. Prayer should be who-focused? God-focused. Look at this. Pray this way, then. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven. And he is, he is asking and longing that his name would be holy. God's name is holy. May your name be holy. Who's that prayer about so far? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May you fix this place. May your will be done in my life now and forever and ever and ever when your kingdom comes. Who's, who's the focus of that prayer so far? God. Father, may your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, that's about me. Ah, hold on a second. Who are we asking to give us this daily bread? We're asking the Father to do that. Even when we are praying for things for ourselves, the focus can still be about God. As opposed to, Lord, I gotta get this, I gotta get this food, I gotta get this money, I've gotta get this stuff taken care of. 
bless me on my way while I go take care of myself. No, Lord, you give me my daily bread. You give me what I need. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's prayer is a God-focused heart kind of prayer. It's about God. Even when we pray, we're praying about things for ourselves. God is the focus. God is the focus, not ourselves, not ourselves. I love that. I just love that prayer. It's great. It's great. It's all about him. Then we got verse 14, which he reiterates some points about forgiveness here. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. This verse is very clear and, and uh, black and white, right? What Jesus teaches us is that if we forgive others, God forgives us. Our forgiveness from God is, is dependent on our forgiveness to others, all right? So here we're talking about relationship uh, things that are related to not just God, but with individuals. But what Jesus does, even with forgiveness, with things that are primarily just focused about you and I, is even in that, he puts the focus on God. He doesn't just say, forgive, you'll have a better life. Forgive, you'll have more peace. Forgive because you'll be able to sleep at night. He says, forgive because your Father forgives you. And if you forgive, God will forgive you. And if you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. Even in our forgiveness, even in our relationships, it's through this filter, through this lens of God being the focus of everything we do. God being the focus, our, our heart and mind orientation being God-oriented and not ourselves, right? Is there a, a, a personal benefit that we derive from forgiveness? Absolutely. Peace, release, forgiveness, it brings all of that. But man, God being the focus of Lord, even though this is challenging, I am thankful for your forgiveness and I'm going to forgive. And while I'm holding grudges, I'm not looking for that forgiveness that I need from you so desperately daily. Sometimes we don't want to forgive the people in our lives because of the people in our lives. But I'll tell you what, the motivation to forgive because of God really trumps that in my life, doesn't it for you? Right? The people in our lives that need our forgiveness don't often deserve it. And the challenge of forgiveness is that we're tempted to think that if we forgive, that means the evil that they did was all right, which isn't true. Forgiveness doesn't mean that what they did was right. Forgiveness means that we're not going to let it have ownership on us anymore, and we are going to release them from that. The things that God has forgiven us for doesn't mean that things we did were right, do they? No. But he gave us grace and forgiveness. And then there's this one in verse 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. That's the fasting mask they got to pull out of the drawer. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Ha! Think about that. That's so funny, huh? When they're fasting, they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Oh, you're fasting, brother? Man, that must be really hard. I can tell because you're, you're sweating and, you know, you're, you didn't do your hair today. And, oh, you're, not, you're fasting from showers, too. All right. <laughs> must be tough. Must be tough. But, you know, hey, you smell righteous. You smell righteous. <laughs> It's a temptation, huh? That's a temptation if you're fasting, that certainly it's about God, right? You're fasting to draw near to God, to repent of sin maybe, or, 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 or whatever the, the call for the fast is. And uh, it affects you physically. And the temptation there, if it's not solely for God, is that other people would notice at minimum and perhaps commend or sympathize with the challenge that you have. When you're fasting. The what, the, what the Pharisees did and what the hypocrites did is that they would intentionally put themselves 
in a, in a position that they would uh, gain the attention of men. I, I believe that, that uh, the literal rendering of that phrase there is that they would actually distort their faces so that people would recognize them. Right? What's the hungry face? Right? My kids do the hungry face. And it usually comes along with screaming and kicking and stuff like that. Right? That was the Pharisee. Imagine a big old Pharisee kicking his legs. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm just seeking the Lord. No, you're fasting again, aren't you? I could tell. <laughs> you just distorted your face. That's fine. It's good to fast. You should fast. It's good. That's right. But if you're doing it to be noticed, that's your reward right there. That's it. That's all you get. That's all you get. Is it enjoyable? Sure. Does it feel good for somebody to come to you and say, hey, you're fasting. That's awesome. You must, you must really be seeking the Lord. That's great. Praise God. I'll pray for you. Right? That's a great thing to feel. But if that is what, our, where we're, what we're looking for and longing for that, that's it. That's our reward. Our actual pursuit of God to seek his face so that we would be rewarded by seeing it, we exchange it for this, these temporal rewards. So he says to us in verse 17, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will do what? That's it, man. That's what I want. I want God. I want God. I want God to be the rewarder of someone like me who would diligently seek him. I don't want to just gain it from these temporal feel-good moments. They're good, but they're, they're temporal, and they're, that's it. Why trade the things of God and the eternal for momentary pleasure? Or not. Sometimes people don't notice, but our hearts are still longing to be noticed, and then we just get ticked off because, man, they didn't even see that I've been fasting this whole time, right? The only reason I want people to know that I'm fasting is because I start losing weight or something like that, not because of my distorting face. So he tells us that when we're fasting, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So be genuine. Don't be a hypocrite. So with our worship, I want my worship to be God-centered, not man-centered. I want my good deeds to be God-focused and not man-focused. This is what Jesus wants from us. Our prayers to be God-centered and God-focused, not man-centered. And our fasting and, and just all of our worship in general should be about Him. Should be for Him. Not for us. Not for the reward that we gain in this life. So here's some good questions to ask. Is what I'm doing about God or about me? Is what I'm doing about God or about me? Even the good things that we do. Is this about God or is this about me? Is this about God or is this about me? Will this bring glory to God or glory to me? Will this bring attention to God or attention to me? Will this bring attention to God or will this bring attention to me? So then he closes this part in verse 19 and he says this. In light of the reward uh, of even the, the temporal and the accolades or the eternal, he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Most often when I read this, I think about this, you know, with money and stuff. And, and it's talking about that. But think about it in the context of what we just read, right? About the reward that we will be storing up. Is it the temporal are the, are, the, are the things that we're longing to gain as our reward, the accolades of other people, the attention of other people, right? Is that what we're storing up? Those things fade. Those things aren't always going to happen. Those things aren't always even genuine sometimes. They don't last. Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But instead, 
Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moss nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, what you really long care about, there your heart will be also. That'll be what you're really living for. Every good thing that you or I may do, every prayer we pray, every time we fast, every time we, we give to someone in need, every single time you or I do any of those things, God sees it. God sees the prayers that you've prayed, stumbling over your words, not very eloquent, maybe very short, maybe just something in your heart. You didn't even get the words out. God heard every single one of those prayers. You know that? Every good thing you've ever done for somebody, even if they hated you in return, even if nobody knows about it, you know who knows about it? God knows about it. Every time you've sought him with your whole heart, maybe you fasted, maybe you withdrew and, and abstained from certain things in your life so you could get serious about seeking God. Every single time you've done that, you know who noticed that? God noticed that. I may not have noticed that. Your family may not have noticed that. Maybe they did. But you know who did? God did. God heard every one of those prayers. God saw every good thing that you ever did. God knows about every single time that you or I did any of those things. Some of us may feel very overwhelmed because we've done a lot of good things and actually nobody's ever noticed it. And we feel, uh, we wonder if we should even continue to do it. How about the parents who have done good and labored in prayer for their kids, but yet the kids, you know, whether young or old, still go their own way. God has seen every prayer. He's heard every prayer that you've prayed, even if you didn't receive the temporal reward in this life yet. God has seen everyone. He's heard every prayer. And you know what he's doing? He's keeping this great and secure storehouse full of all of these things in heaven. In heaven, there is this somehow, this big old bank, this vault, that every single one of those things is being kept and preserved and, and, and cherished by God. And you don't see that. You, none of us see that. None of us, none of us know that that place exists. We don't know the combination to get in. But it's there. It's there. A record a storehouse, a place of reward for all of the, the, the righteous deeds of all of the saints. You know who's guarding that door? Jesus is guarding that door. And when the time is right, Jesus is going to bust into that, uh, that big vault in the sky. He's going to take out all of those things that, that you or I and all the faithful have done. He's going to gather them up in a big old bag or something. He's not, you just all thought of Santa Claus, I know. <laughs> follow me here. He's going to gather them up, and, and what, what's going to happen is that all of these righteous things that we've done for God and not for anyone else are going to end up and turn into a reward from God and from Christ. And Jesus is going to leave heaven, that great storehouse for all of these great treasures, and he's going to come back to the earth. And with these treasures, he is going to reward openly all of those people that have done and prayed and said all of these glorious things that nobody has ever noticed. And you and I are going to stand before the king when he hands out these crowns, when he hands out these re rewards of righteous deeds. He's going to call us before him and say, I know nobody saw that. I know nobody knows about that. But I did. But I did. What a day that's going to be. When our reward that have been stored in heaven so that nobody can mess with it, are going to be brought to the earth through our Lord's power and our Lord's hand and be distributed as rewards and glorious things to his saints. That's going to be quite the day. So which, which reward, which day of, of reward are you living for? Which day? The temporal the one that comes, goes, fades, even if it lasts your whole life, but is buried in the ground with you. Or receiving the reward of Christ coming back 
and rewarding the faithful people that did things for his father just as he did. Just as he did. I want to seek God for God. I want to worship God for God, not for myself. Not for myself. Let's have the worship team come back up and let's pray. Why don't you pray uh, silently just for a moment. Ask God to help your heart be your motivation to be for His glory. Lord, Father, God, you're so worthy of these things. And these things, Father, fasting, praying, doing good, they're all good and they're all right. But I pray that you would help my heart to be motivated by doing them for you, to see you, to know you, to bless you. Lord, I know I I rejoice in the great day of reward um, when your son returns to the earth. It's going to be wonderful. But Father, I know that the, the, the great reward is to do these things to bless you. Even if there was no accolade that came in the end, but because you're worthy of glory, because you're worthy of honor, because you're worthy of praise. I imagine on that day we're all going to throw our crowns down anyway. Because you alone are worthy of glory, honor, majesty, and power. So we pray, Father, that you would help our hearts to be motivated by you, help our prayers to be focused on you, help our good deeds to be focused on you. Help our prayers, our worship, our fasting, everything to be about you. Lord, just make our lives about you. This is what we're talking about today. That the disciples of Jesus have lives that are about about you, God. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. To know your will, to see your plan, I need your help so I can stand and know your voice and trust your way. No more compromise. And no more wasted days To know your will To feel you smile I want to be A faithful child Who knows your voice And who trusts your way Days. In my weakness, in my weakness, you are strong. So take my hand and lead me on to higher ground where I can say. No more wasted days to know your will, to see your plan. I need your help so I can stand and know your voice and trust your way. No more compromise.
compromise and no more wasted days. Lord, lift me up. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith in Thy almighty hand, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on high. Lord, in my weakness, you are strong. So take my hand and lead me on to higher ground where I can stay. No more compromise and no more waste. Days. No more compromise and no more wasted days. Amen. Let's worship.